Hey everybody, it's Meg Riley here in Minneapolis where it is a gorgeous fall day, sunny, which is a lovely gift. I was out last week in Western Massachusetts, which was exceptionally beautiful and I love the fall. Christina, I'm so glad to see you again. I feel like we've been ships passing in the night. How are you doing? <laughs> That's exactly it. <laughs> Two ships passing in the night. It's great to see all the view crew together again. I'm doing well. I'm in Charlottesville, Virginia, where blessedly, 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 fall has finally arrived. I couldn't be happier to see the backside of those ridiculous, hot, humid summer days. Um, and uh, so I'm looking at my window and it just looks really nice. Like I could open my window and it would just be lovely. Thanks so much. Michael Tino, how you doing? Good morning, everyone. This is Michael Tino. I'm doing okay. Thank you. Um, I'm here in my office in Mount Kisco, New York, where uh, the storms have blown through. A nor'easter popped up the East Coast this week and um, Everything is dry, though my child's school does not have power. So, uh, <laughs> well, it might by now. She had a delay, and luckily I have grandparents in town. So she's with them, and I'm here in my office, and life is okay. Asia Hauser, out on the West Coast at the crack of dawn. Yep, uh, it's Asia Hauser. It's 4 a.m. here. No, I always exaggerate. It's only 8. Um, it only feels like 4. Actually, that's not even true. I was on the East Coast for a week, so I'm actually I'm whining for no reason because it actually feels like 11 to me right now. Uh, I'm in Seattle, Washington, and the gray days are upon us. They started yesterday, and people, some people here get very gloom and doom. Like, we're not going to see the sun again until April. I'm like, stop with that exaggerating. We'll see the sun by Sunday, I promise. It's a lot sunnier than people led me to believe when I first moved here. So um, it is fall, it's rainy, we need the water. So I frankly never complain about the rain with the state of the universe. Um, so very happy to see you all, yay. Antonia, how are you? Life is good here in Delaware in Wilmington. It is a little bit windy and gray, but it's not hot. So yay, I'm doing well. Thank you. And where will you be this morning, Antonia, as we broadcast The View? I am already in the chat box over on Facebook, chatting up with people, saying hello to Catherine Drew Jones, right, in, right there, first person to say hello, and hello to the 11 other viewers that are here. So that's where I am. Fantastic. We have a great show today, but before we get to that, we just always chat a little bit about what's new in Unitarian Universalism. I think we're all getting really excited about the Blue Symposium coming up at the end of the month, where we will be broadcasting live, which is very exciting. Michael Tino will be at home, maybe chatting with everybody from New York, but the yeah, rest of us I'll be will be... On the, I'll be on the Facebook live chat while you That's all are, are live in Minneapolis. And we're going to do it at the lunch hour, so it'll be a little bit of a different time in two weeks, but we don't we all want to be in, we don't want to miss anything. So anyway, that'll be really fun. Um, what else is going on? Um, so I just want to give a shout out to um, Manish Misra Marzetti and Jennifer Nordstrom, who we had on the show um, just a little while ago, uh, talking about Justice on Earth, which was the common read, the UUA common read. Um, and I would just like to invite folks that if they um, have read it and, you know, enjoyed the material there to uh, pop over onto Amazon. I'm going to put the link in the chat section and think about leaving a review. Um, sometimes the ways in which we see um, uh, white supremacy culture come up is in um, how people use their positional power in leaving reviews, and it would be nice to see folks use that for good. <laughs> so just uh, an invitation to um, take that up and, and check out the View episode uh, where we talked with Manish, which was um, really, really uh, enlightening and, and a lot of fun, too. So. Excellent. Also, I think it might be time to Recenter the book Centering, uh, which was edited by Mitra Ranama, and Manish is also in that book, and so am I, and uh, several uh, ministers and religious professionals of color that talk about the
the experience of being religious leaders of color in a predominantly white denomination. And a shout out to several committees that are meeting in Boston, including the UUA board, the UUA nominating committee, the UUA board. Um, I don't, I said several and now I don't know who what the others are, but I'm sure others are meeting. So yay, you all. So you're done with the nominating committee, Asia? Yeah, I, once I uh, got officially on the Lareda board as president elect, um, I, you know, the, mm, my hair would start falling out, not only turning gray. So got I it. like my hair for now. So. <laughs> I like your hair too. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> so yeah, I'm not on the nominating committee anymore. <laughs> Michael, you were going to say something? Uh, well, having experienced all of my hair falling out, thanks to UUA service. Um, <laughs> uh, no, I just wanted to, to to build on, Christina mentioned the common read from last year, but um, we are eagerly awaiting the study guide for the common read for this year, which is an indigenous people's history of the United States. Um, and it comes in both adult and youth versions. Um, and uh, so I'm really getting very excited here about doing multi-generational common read conversations um, because there's a, a version accessible to younger uh, readers in it. Um, and the, the website, I know this because I went on it yesterday, promises mid-October for the study guide. And it's mid-October. So we, we, we're eagerly awaiting that study guide um, with, no, with no time pressure, because that's like a white supremacist culture construct, right? But at some point soon, it will be out and we will get to use it and it will be fabulous. Yeah, that's just, a great book. It is. And um, the uh, Lareda board has decided to do that as the common read. And we're actually going to read the youth version. Um, so we're, we're actually excited to, to check that out because we thought it'd be great to, as a board, just have a book to be able to go through together. And, and uh, thought the selection of the common read this year was um, really interesting and, and really interesting in that they had both an adult and youth version. Roxanne Dunbar was here in Seattle and she gave a shout out not only to Beacon Press for printing the book. I saw her speak. She also said, are there any Unitarians in the house? So like seven of us started screaming. It was very cool. That never happened. So, um, and I started reading the youth version. It is beyond excellent. I mean, obviously the adult one is too, but the youth one is so accessible. I'm like, I need youth versions of all books. Yeah, they did. A, they did People's History of the United States. Beacon did as a graphic novel, which I thought was really great too. Yeah, the, shout out to Beacon Press. We, I, you know, I was just at the retired minister's um, gathering, giving the keynote they did 50 years since Stonewall. So I talked about my work about the religious right in the 90s and, and everybody's work for marriage equality. And, um, and Helen Atwan sent me a book list of everything that Beacon had published on queer stuff. Uh, marriage and other stuff and it's phenomenal i remember when they had to leave 25 beacon street and move or they were at 78 but move over to 24 farnsworth they had to get rid of a lot of books and i took my must have been like 17 year old young trans kid and they said take all the books you want and jaya is never particularly impressed with me or anything i do <laughs> but they were like oh my god they published everything look at this you know they ended up with this giant pile of books because they have just been so steadfast in anti oppression work for so long so yeah i always love to give a shout out for them they, they their books have changed my life and yeah, Roxanne Dunbar Ortiz was here. Did I say her name wrong? It's Roxanne Dunbar. She has another name. That's too, right. right, Roxanne Dunbar Ortiz. Ortiz. Right. Okay, she was here right after the election, and I, I may have said this here, but she she looked at us. I mean, it was like literally the day after the election. She the 2016 election. She, it had been planned for a long time, and she just looked out and she said, "You know, we've survived 500 years of authoritarian rule and." you're not gonna like it. <laughs> and it was like, it was such a understatement, <laughs> you know, but it was, it just put everything in perspective so much. And that book, yeah, is an amazing book. So I'm, I'm gonna try to get Minnetonka, the little church where I'm serving, which obviously has a native name, uh, to, um, to do that read. I'm also really excited that it could be multi-gen. 
so. And, and I've learned recently that apparently um, our relationships with indigenous peoples, especially in the Northeast, will be a major theme of GA 2020 in Providence too. So as, uh, you know, as we're, we're getting set to, to go to that GA, um, if people engage in this common read, they'll actually have some, some background to be able to, to do that work more deeply. So we should have a show. We, we need to have a show about this. Absolutely. Um, yeah, here in Minnesota, you know, there's such a huge Dakota Lakota community. It's, a, it's um, and has been, I mean, forever, obviously, but also politically, really since the American Indian Movement 50 years ago. And um, like the, the theme of our May Day Parade this year was 50 years of AIM, you know, and, and so there's been a real political um, awareness here that I don't see in a lot of other parts of the country. Like many people, I grew up in West Virginia and Ohio thinking that Native American people were extinct. I mean, I, I, when I moved to Portland and I saw people, I was like, who are those people? I had no idea. So I, I think, I, I hope no other child grows up as completely idiotic as I was. Um, I know my kid read original sources of Native writers when they were in middle school and stuff. So. I hope that it's really different. Well, anything else before we turn to our guests? I'm very excited about our show. They've been very quiet. <laughs> so I actually do have a thing I'd like to add to the okay, news, you add. Add which to is just that we have lost Elijah Cummings, um, the congressman from Maryland, which was my state before I came here. Um, and just, I'm thinking of him. Yeah, yeah, that's a real loss. He's been, he's been such a steady voice for so long. And yeah, thank you. So we have two guests today. Uh, we have Heather Petit, and she, she is a she, her pronouns. Heather's a UU seminarian in her final year at Lancaster Theological Seminary in Pennsylvania right? Lancaster, Pennsylvania, and is interning with Equal Access and AIM this year. And we'll have you talk about what those are. She's autistic, disabled, and multiply neurodivergent, as well as queer. Heather loves preaching, liturgical design, and public speaking, and also loves organizational transformation work, especially with process and governance. You go, man. <laughs> She lives in Delaware with her husband and four kids and currently works as an IT consultant. And we have coming back uh, to the show, we have Reverend Catherine Clarenbach, who's an entrepreneurial UU community minister, whose experience includes what are commonly called attention deficit disorder, bipolar disorder, and complex post-traumatic stress disorder. All of these conditions shape the way she moves through the world, how she perceives people in creation, and what she needs and gives. Her concerns in intersectional, anti-racist, fat, queer, environmental, and feminist justice feed her desire for deeper understanding of disability justice. In order to extend that justice and welcome, she offers groups and one-to-one -one spiritual accompaniment specifically for queer neurodivergent people, including those with ADD and autism. These groups are part of her online ministry, thewayoftheriver.com, where she offers several different ways of approaching divine presence within and outside ourselves. So thank you so much for both of you for being here. And we really, you know, wanted to talk about what you've learned and seen that can benefit all of us. So Heather, let's start with you because you cite uh, equal access and aim. And why don't you start by sharing what those are and what the work is of those. So uh, Equal Access and AIM are the accessibility and inclusion functions uh, that are associated with the UUA and are actually uh, at this point working on moving into becoming uh, a function within the UUA instead of a separate entity. So that part of the work that I'm doing with them is around the transformation um, from a separate to an integrated function. Um, which, um, from my perspective, is super, super, super important because having the conversation within the UUA structure around 
um, disability about around inclusion um, and around access uh, instead of having it as a conversation with the UUA <laughs> is um, it's a subtle but I think it's a really important difference and it's something that I know a lot of um, a lot of folks especially um, within the seminarians groups that I know are very concerned with um, so the the aim piece of that is the function that helps congregations become more accessible and inclusive um, so there's a certification process and you can um, check out their website um, and see if, if that's a process you want to go through and there's a lot of resources there part of what we're doing is there's um, forums that we do and I'm helping put together the resources so that people will have like a simple kind of place to start when they're looking at a particular topic for each of the um, for each of the uh, forum topics. So a lot of different things that are available, a lot of resources available, and even if a congregation doesn't want to um, move all the way through the process of you know, being certified, there's a lot of things that they could just brush up very easily from looking at the site. So um, as an intern, mostly what I'm doing is uh, helping hands. So learning what's going on and providing materials and research, um, accessing my autistic functions, <laughs> um, employing those to do a lot of um, uh, research and putting things together. Thank you so much. And Catherine, you're doing an entrepreneurial ministry. Um, so you're working kind of outside of the structures that Heather just talked about. Um, was that- I'm so, I just need to say, go Heather, right? She's doing some amazing stuff, that's wonderful. I'm so glad to hear that you're in those groups and part of those groups. And, um, and I'd love to hear you talk, I'm pretending I'm a host. I'd love to hear you talk at some point. You said using my autistic functions um, for, and not everybody may know what, those um, are. what that means in the context of what you were talking about. So I hope we get to come back to that or you can answer it now. Well, why don't you since okay. it was asked. Oh. <laughs> yeah, brought up. So um, one of my superpowers is pattern thinking. Um, I also, the capacity to intensely focus is another feature. Um, so going down rabbit holes <coughs> for an extended period of time when you're doing research um, <coughs> is a strength. Um, and I've used this for all of my employment, um, the pattern thinking in particular, being able to spot where I'm going to be able to find something or what kinds of things I need to um, convey very quickly just from collecting enormous amounts of data in my head so um, that's it's something that i get paid for <laughs> um, but it's also really useful when you're trying to get um, you're trying to get a lot of different people to understand or access information in a way that's effective for them being able to see the pattern across all of that information to say, okay, so if generally people are trying to figure out what's their first step, here's what 15 different people and organizations have said are good first steps. Um, so being able to pull that up and just have it like super obvious to me. Sounds like an incredible gift. Yeah, thank you. And thanks, Catherine, for, <laughs> for asking more. Sure. And so Catherine, you just, I'm just, kind of getting you both into the room for the conversation. Sure. You're, you're doing an entrepreneurial ministry with ritual and all kinds of other things. How, how has this emerged for you as a focused ministry? One of the things that has been true about my ministry from the beginning is that it is the folks I'm working with who have created my ministry. From the very beginning, people have said, hey, can you do this? Are you available for this? Um, and I started looking around at the folks with whom I was working and also thinking about what I myself need from uh, spiritual accompaniment and companionship. And I thought, there, I see all these people 
who are queer and neurodivergent in our uh, in our tradition and in my company, several of whom are religious professionals. And so I um, and I had been thinking of starting small group spiritual accompaniment for some time. And so I've begun one uh, small group that is uh, specifically for folks who are both queer and neurodivergent. And that is my, my current contribution to the, to the conversation is that, and I'll probably be opening another one that is specifically identity-based in January. And one of the things that we try to do in those groups is just acknowledge that people are in groups differently, right? That people um, move differently and need to be on screen or off screen differently and um, may prefer not to sit down, but be, um, you know, moving in the in the screen um, as we're having our meeting and um, and saying explicitly we know that different people have different needs for how they show up in a, in a space um, just that I think has been really important and has freed up folks to feel like I can be more authentic in this space than I find I can in a lot of spaces. So I'm interested uh, in lots of stuff that has already <laughs> been said, but very particularly in, um, in the fact that the groups that you're running uh, or the group that you're running is for people who are both queer and neurodivergent. So I'm wondering, and, and I invite Heather, you to, to answer this too. I'm wondering if you could uh, reflect for us how queerness and, and neurodivergence um, uh, intersect with each other, complement one another, um, uh, overlap one another, uh, however you would you would phrase it. I don't know how you would phrase it, so I'm going <laughs> to. Um, I think Heather can probably answer this from a more uh, focused place, but I'll I'll step up to bat first, um, just given my experience with the folks that I'm um, working with, which is that we know that, for example, um, complex PTSD shows up in queer people more often than it does in the general population. Um, and neurodivergence, so it came and is most commonly associated with autism, and it came from the autistic community. Um, folks talk about cousins of uh, PTSD and complex PTSD, ADD slash ADHD, as well as autism. And there's a lot of kind of swimming around. See, I told you Heather could be more focused than I could. There's a lot, <laughs> there's a lot more, um, there's a lot of swimming around among those three sets of things that intersects with a higher incidence in the queer community um, than in the general population. But to be honest, my experience was is is anecdotal and in that sense i'm using anecdote as the singular of data um <laughs> which it only kind of is um but my that's who my folks are that's who my folks have turned out to be i don't know heather what do you think about this so there's there's so i'm gonna go researchy <laughs> um there is a lot of research supporting the um the that in autistic community there's in that population there's a much higher incidence of um queer identity um so both from a sexuality and gender perspective um that uh that there's there's a million theories floating around i have my pet theory which is um 
since social norms and rules don't translate well to me, they don't make sense to me, it was much easier to not get kind of mentally cornered into uh, tracking in one particular direction. So uh, being fluid and being much more, well, of course, <laughs> um, is, uh, is just like the natural way of being. So there's no stress or pressure or anxiety around that, which makes it much easier for people to step into that identity. Um, so I'm talking about um, you know, self-identified folks as opposed to um, people who are still um, actively closeted. So within that, um, within autistic space, A, we know that there's just a higher proportion. You know, like if you go and do the analysis, the proportions are higher. Um, and there's also, um, because the rules of relationship differ in autistic space, there's uh, a great deal more comfort in being open um, than I think in a lot of uh, more neurotypical spaces. So those kind of all work together. There's concepts like neuroqueer, um, where there is, it is impossible to extract your neurology from your sense of queerness. Um, and, uh, and, and also things like ought gender, which is kind of how I identify. Um, that uh, I don't really understand knowing that you have a gender. So I recognize that other people do, but I, I can tell you that there's rules around how gender presents in different cultures and different spaces, but I can't tell you what it feels like to be a gender. <laughs> so, um, because that it's not a function that exists for me. Um, so that kind of, uh, um, difference in the way we approach the social constructs, I think, plays a big role in how queerness intersects with uh, neurodivergent space. Thank you, Heather. Catherine, my question to you is, what are some of the ways you present your ministry differently that supports and affirms neurodivergent folks more fully? Um, that has layers. One layer is that I simply in my work as an, now I have to be careful with this word. Sometimes I'll say independent, by which I do not mean in any way separated from accountability or relationship with the larger UU religious professional movement. But sometimes I'll say independent just to say that I do a lot of my work in an entrepreneurial way and context. So. Um, and if you look at the home page of my website, it talks about, um, particularly about gender and, um, and being, just being different from those around you and saying, this difference is not the problem. The problems you are encountering are in my, I'm working on a, a page called, Is This You? And um, acknowledging that the, the problems are not with us, with, with the mental wiring and um, ways of being that we have in the world. They're about access as is so often the case, right? They're about that. So just putting that front and center is first, you know, is the first layer. Um, another thing that has been helpful um, is just asking, what, what do you need? Um, and, you know, I had some folks who uh, helped me realize that it's useful for me to have questions in a in a um, a talk like this be written in the chat box like you know one might do um, but that I as a person with ADD I need to have my stuff broken up 
right? A complex visual field, like Heather is talking about um, superpower of pattern recognition. And my little ADD heart is like, oh my God, no. Because <laughs> context and patterns are really hard for us um, on the, the ADD side of cousinhood. Um, often, like a dense refrigerator is my total enemy. I Please find the milk. No. <laughs> no, can't find the milk. Um, but so, so asking, putting things front and center, and um, and trying and experimenting with new things, telling people, okay, this is a space where it's going to be okay for folks to move around, was huge. Um, one of my clients routinely um, moves her hands like this, and it's not. It's a. It's a way of dealing with sensory um, inputs. And Heather can talk a lot more about this. Um, a way of dealing with sensory inputs, and she's not allowed to do that in other spaces, right? She. She has to like clamp down on her own uh, expression and her own needs for the comfort of other people. And so again and again and again, when we talk about access, when we talk about inclusion of anyone, what, to what degree is the comfort of the most dominant person in the room, the most important thing? And to what degree do we create spaces that are designed with people in mind who aren't in that dominant position? So that leads me to a question which you're beginning to address already. What are some of the obstacles you both hear most about that neurodivergent people experience in our congregations, things that have people not want to go back or make it very uncomfortable. I'm gonna <laughs> jump on that one. Um, so from a, from a general perspective, the first thing that's really, really essential for, um, for autistic people in particular, but I suspect for a lot of others is relational safety. Um, so that really, um, the, like the number one thing for accessibility is really being covenantal, like that, that, that question, like asking the question and then listening to the, the answer that you're getting back and holding that, uh, relationally, that, um, is super, super important because the, per so <laughs> one of the things about being autistic is if you've met one autistic person, you've met one autistic person. Um, when our brains are at rest, apparently they don't match up like you can do brain scans and nobody matches anybody else. We're all incredibly, incredibly unique in function. So there's no way to make every space meet everybody's needs 100%. It's just not possible. And it's, and it, it's, um, even within me, I have needs that are in conflict with each other. <laughs> So from that perspective, that's the first thing is, you know, be covenantal and ask um, the person in front of you what, it, what they need. So not being asked is a huge barrier. Um, but there's a lot of stuff around um, sensory processing that's super important for autistic folks um, and for lots of other people as well. Um, uh, lighting, um, space that's quiet, um, the ability to walk out without that being a problem, <laughs> like um, that's, uh, you know, and I don't want to, if I need to leave, I don't need to be pursued. <laughs> um, that's, you know, I'm leaving for, to take care of me, not because I'm mad. Um, so um, fluorescent lights is one you'll see a lot as a big issue. Um, because uh, we can actually see the flicker of many of us, um, and it's overwhelming. Uh, the degree of sound in the space, how much uh, visual distraction there is, um, uh, a lot of that is just 
hard to process and then people want to talk to you. <laughs> um, so that's just kind of the <coughs> cognitive pieces. Um, because it's so unique, I think asking is probably the, the biggest function. Um, the, but you can't ask unless you have relational safety because I'm gonna mask the heck out of it and I am gonna give you an answer you wanna hear um, if I don't trust you. Um, so that's, uh, that's a piece that takes some, um, some self-reflection to be able to address, I think. Well, and masking, you're talking about masking the hell out of you, or maybe you said the heck out of you, probably you did. <laughs> um, uh, is, a, is a huge thing, right? That, that, and is a word that comes out of autistic community and is really um, important in, I think, in all of this, this discussion. Can you say more about that? Sure. About masking? Sure. So um, for a lot of the stuff that you'll see um, around autistic behaviors that are quote, you know, visible and notable to other folks, they're things that people already, um, that everybody does. Um, so mm -hmm. everybody masks to some degree. It's the degree of significance of the masking that makes a big difference and how much trauma is associated with it. So masking is, um, I choose my language, I choose my um, body position. I'm thinking constantly about what my expression is doing because my uh, resting expression might not reflect the emotional state that you think it's going to. So I'm calculating what, uh, what expression I need to make so that you think that I'm feeling the thing that I'm actually feeling. Um, I have to manage my words, my uh, body language, gesture, uh, how much I'm stimming in a, vis in a visible way, all of that stuff has to be suppressed into something that approximates a neurotypical norm, um, which I don't actually understand accurately, so I get wrong on a regular basis. <laughs> um, and there's a great deal of trauma associated, you know, one of the places that uh, autism crosses over into the cousin space very easily is uh, PTSD is, uh, I think like 7% of autistic people have PTSD just from being autistic and alive. Um, so that uh, trauma response uh, is associated with the masking. And so asking us to unmask without safety is also an issue. Mm -hmm. um, but being able to unmask is phenomenal. Being able to unmask in space and just be myself is amazing. Um, and it's a, uh, uh, and it's something that it, like, when you're more healed and more able to be functional in the world, um, you can choose the degree and placement, but uh, it's not like we wanna necessarily put the masks away permanently for everything because they are a functional part of how we relate to each other. Mm -hmm. But uh, not masking to the degree that I am never myself, that's, you know, kind of the goal. So we have a couple of comments and, and uh, from the folks online that I wanted to read out, but I also wanted to just, um, you know, give a shout out for the energy, the emotional energy and physical energy it takes um, to do that, to mask and to not be your authentic self and then be expected to be um, presenting in a certain way um, to the dominant culture is tremendous. And so, you know, when you talk about that PTSD, but, you know, even in that moment of, you know, why people are so exhausted, <laughs> you know, at the end of the day, if we come from marginalized identities, when they go home from just having been out in the world, um, that, that energy is just tremendous. And so, you know, people can, can just think about that, you know, um, it, it, that would just be huge as well. Um, yeah, and before you, I, I just, I'm compelled. <laughs> um, and uh, just to, to piggyback on that, some people don't have to think when they walk into a room through every 
thing that we're about to say or do or how we look or they don't have to do that work. And so the lack of imagination and um, or the sometimes just the ignorance, but also I think a lack of imagination of understanding the energy it takes and you and you said this beautifully, Christina, and I don't mean to to imply that you didn't, but just the energy that it takes to think, okay, I'm gonna do this, now I'm do it, what happened? And to do that on a more conscious level, because you have to, um, is is a huge piece of just life in the world. And I I also just wanted to lift up something that Heather said to me that um, she almost said just now, but we were talking about how for artistic people, she said, life is traumatic. Just being out in the world is traumatic, can be. And thus you have the PTSD right. crossover. Yeah, especially with the sensory processing can be yeah. so incredibly overwhelming and you can't like you know turn off your ears necessarily i mean yay for noise canceling headphones but <laughs> um but if you don't you don't know that your kid is autistic you don't know that they're being overwhelmed um and kids learn to mask very early but the um there was something that you said that was picking up on something else and i've lost the pattern but um <laughs> so we'll, i think we'll switch to the next um, so Jack Mandeville said, what I appreciate about Catherine is that she acknowledges neurodivergence in her various ministries. Rock on for that. Thank you. Um, Rachel Keating Rott said, oh, that's so important. Such a beautiful way of putting it. Covenant listening relationally. That was that piece about that uh, Heather was talking about. Um, um, Ty Resendiz de Perez said, preach. Yes. Creating faith, faith spaces that don't center comfort of a single dominant group limits us all. Um, Anne E. Schumann said, conflicting internal needs, big yes to that, absolutely. Um, and then there was a question that I wanted to put out uh, that was from A.J. Van Tyne that said, many congregations are using projector slides these days. Any best, worst practices on their format slash use in service for accessibility, I'm guessing that they add to the visual stimuli. So um, in one sense, they do add to the visual stimuli and it really is gonna be dependent. You know, you'll have to ask the people in your congregation what, what creates the problem. But having something like that, that's very simple to focus on so I can kind of not look at all the people moving um, is, is actually beneficial to me. Um, one of the challenges I have with them is when people use things that are not high contrast. Um, so keeping it simple, I don't need it to have pretty pictures behind the words. <laughs> Just give me the words. Um, and you know, it's, it's not about aesthetics, it's about access. So I would rather have a, a nice clean black and white um, that I can read easily than um, than have it be aesthetically pleasing, which, you know, and I, I get being in a space that's aesthetically pleasing is very soothing for lots of people, but the extra visuals create more noise for me. Um, so that um, positioning of where it is may also um, have an impact for folks. Um, having to look around a lot of different places may or may not be a problem. Again, you kind of have to, to check um yeah but, kind of what you were saying is that relational um part of not assuming that everything is going to work for everyone yeah that, and uh, and it may be that some people for whom it doesn't work are really going to prefer having a piece of paper with it printed instead sure and and it, providing those multiple avenues of entry um is really helpful um cynthia carter miller said thank you so much for talking positively about neurodivergence and uh, Ty, I also said, I'm um, asking with so much labor, the fact that we create spaces that require community members to rigorous, rigorously mask, exhausts our energy as individuals and a community. 
yeah, there was something uh, on that piece that um, that I wanted to comment on, um, which is, you know, I, I was raised UU, so I have you know the whole lifetime of <laughs> a few U spaces, um, and one of the the things that I've loved about UU space is that we are very enthusiastic about people being themselves. At the same time, we have a lot of very subtle ways of saying that you're allowed to be yourself. We want you to be yourself, but not like that. You're doing you wrong. So that um, people can really believe they're being welcoming and still being and still require masking substantially. So that's something that um, that can be incredibly <laughs> um, it's very gaslighting um, and and recognizing that you do it and and you know i grew up in these spaces i i'm sure i have done that to other people um that uh that's a really important piece of the work for our congregational spaces in my opinion do you have stories of congregations or other places that are doing a good job of welcoming neurodivergent folks of you know, all kinds. We're talking about a huge variety of folks here. So, <laughs> I, I, I'm sorry, Heather. Did you go ahead? No, no, go ahead. I'm thinking. Okay, um, I'm trying to think of what congregation this was, and it may have been the congregation in Bloomington, Indiana. I'm not sure, um, but. Um, it had, it struck me when I saw this congregation's homepage that their invitations to, if you need to be in a space that's more quiet, we have this space. If you need to be in a space where you can walk around um, or you know that you're going to need to move or talk, be welcome to use this close by, still um, kind of enclosed, uh, embraced maybe is a better word, in the communal experience of worship was a huge thing to see just matter of factly part of their welcome. Um, and I think I, and I haven't been to um, worship at, at this congregation, so I don't know how well it, it plays out. Um, but their clear focus on neurodivergence as a welcome part and followed by concrete examples of what they were doing to make it possible to to hopefully avoid what Heather was just talking about, you know, which so many of us have experienced um, as, you, you know, the be, be yourself, no, not that, right? Be yourself, that's not it either, um, ha, ha, is associated with, you know, yes masking and also the classic low self-esteem of people with adhd as well right that you have folks who are like i can't do it right i can't do it right i keep trying to do it better i keep trying and trying and trying it. i can't do it right and and i'll add um kind of what you were saying about that invitation as one of the um most welcoming uh, facilitated meetings that I've been to um, was a facilitation that said that invited people to flap and to get up and move and to um, you know just all of those things because even for those of us that don't identify as neurodivergent like it's really hard for me to sit in a chair you know for and not move and not like see something over there I need to go and get it or or whatever and just to be having that invitation to to do those things was was so freeing um and and i think it's one of those instances where we're doing ourselves like the the ways we hold ourselves back 
um, you know, is just so sad sometimes. And, and so, you know, to be freed um, just by invitation by a facilitator to say, yeah, do all those things. That's fine. We totally get it. Um, was really beautiful. And, and so, you know, it, there, there's something in there for everybody. Yeah, I think the invitation to move um, is, um, you know, however your body needs to be comfortable is a big thing that you could do without knowing who's in your audience. You never know who walks in the door, right? Um, and you won't have had a chance to ask them. And, and we saw that AJ is basically saying, how do, how do I set this up in advance? Um, the, uh, the welcome in, in either in text or in your actual service say, naming that you know, you're free to move about as you need um, is just that that would just make me relax tremendously just having that piece there. Um, the, uh, the lighting being not aggressive, <laughs> um, helps for me when I walk in the door, but it would be a problem for other people I know. So anyone, you know, so visual processing can be very different. Um, and anybody who has uh, a, a vision disability or blind, um, will have, um, different issues with that. So you can't really set that up in advance in a particular way. Natural light works better for me than other spaces, but I'm not going to ask you to change your architecture. Um, so that's, there are, there are pieces and just, you know, another shout out for the forums coming up on <laughs> from, um, from AIM. Um, can you, is, can you say more about those forums coming up? Yeah. So there is, um, there's, I don't have the list in front of me of what, what the next ones are, but there will be one on neurodivergence. Um, so you'll have basically you know, specific information for that one. Um, and we have, I think social justice is the, it, the first one coming up next is actually worship. Um, so inclusive worship. And then after that is um, uh, social justice activities. So, and then later on we'll have a neurodivergence one specifically. So there will be work like, handouts and other things available to help people out on that piece. Um, but yeah, um, for places that, you know, as so you had asked, places that were actually truly um, welcoming. Um, I've had people be very direct with me. My workplace is phenomenal, um, or my IT workplace. Um, I've had people be very direct with me to, to like bring out who I am into that space and ask me, what is it that you could do if, you know, like you weren't um, trying to you know, contain who you are. Um, and also um, the other thing that's really important for, um, for autistic people is accommodation for meltdowns. Um, the, uh, you know, I'm, I'm an adult, I still have meltdowns. They look different than when I was a kid, but, um, but, um, I have had phenomenal accommodation at work for having a meltdown. Somebody just just accompanying me physically um, without distress, doing their own thing, but staying with me. So I'm like not feeling like I'm scaring everybody away. But at the same time, keeping everything quiet and not focusing too much attention on me. Um, that for me is super, super helpful. Um, and it gives me uh, a tr like I can get through it quickly and and actually get back to doing what I need to be doing if I have that kind of accommodation. If I have to suppress it, it just takes a lot longer. <laughs> so that um, so even just having a room that people could go to if they need to just not be yes. <laughs> the one question I didn't I don't think we have a lot of time to to talk about, but I would love to talk to you all about it um, more. Is you know we've talked a lot about congregation life and being um, a little bit more accessible, but one of the things um, we see, at least as religious educators, um, is how to make our religious education spaces, um, you know, more accessible because so often, you know, we're the ones that are um, journeying with families as they are getting diagnoses and you know figuring out how they want to if they want to 
um, address and are joy divergence within their families and, and how that plays out in religious education spaces can be um, really beautiful and it can be really, really hard sometimes. Um, and so I just love to put a shout out there for any kind of resources or materials that you all might want to point to or um, for us as religious educators. Um, from a religious education perspective, I think um, I can't direct you to a specific resource per se, but there are a lot of uh, autistic self advocates that are specifically out there talking about how to, as, from an adult perspective, how to effectively interact with autistic kids. Um, and those uh, would be a place to go looking. Um, I I actually know there's a Pete, it was a book by Sally Patton written about 10 years ago called Welcoming Children with Special Needs. And it's now available as a PDF on the UUA website. And it does need updating. And it's a, it's a, it's a very valuable resource as a place to start talking about uh, folks on the spectrum who are autistic and neurodivergent. Uh, she has a lot of really um, on point uh, um, practical ways to address uh, ways to support families. Um, so that book I still recommend to people. And there are now more and more resources online on how to support families. But that was one of the first. She, she had gotten a grant, Sally Patton is the she I'm talking about, uh, to do actual workshops around the country. So she did them about 10 years ago. And they were very helpful. And maybe uh, I'm hoping there's energy to do them again. And we can make it a multi-generational an offering on how to um, I mean, you all are doing that. We don't, that is happening with AIM and equal access. So uh, I think one of the things we can do as Laredo also is help promote that because we need more and more. So thank you. I think I also want to lift up um, just circling back to how relational this work is and how um, mm -hmm. getting to know people and what their needs are and their particular superpowers are and, and all that. And, um, our congregations don't often give our religious professionals, especially religious educators, the space and the time to do that relational work in the depth that is necessary um, to figure out what all the kids in an RE program might need and then to, to help get them, get them that. Um, requires the congregation to give permission uh, <laughs> to, to take that time and to, to to do that work. So I just want to lift up, lift up that as, as a parent dealing with that, also a minister. Well, we're coming to the top of the hour. And as usual, we've barely begun the conversation. <laughs> I am really excited to hear about these webinars coming up where people can deepen in. And Heather, if you can share a link, we will certainly promote those um, on the page. And Catherine, just it's exciting to hear the development of your entrepreneurial ministry and all the directions you're going. Thank you so much for being here. Next week, we're going to have a couple of religious professionals who are social justice coordinators, Kiana Perkins and Amanda Weatherspoon. So that will be a good show. I will not be here, but it will be a great show. And so thanks again. Thanks to all of you who watched and asked good questions and participated well. Sorry we didn't get to share everything that you said. Bye. <laughs>